Somebody said they would rather have me light the daily candle with a match than with a lighter because that's how his booby, his grandmother used to do it. So why not? Let us see here. Okay. Beautiful. Who's in the house? My holy brothers and sisters. Give people a little bit of a chance to find the show. How's everybody doing today? It is Wednesday, February 5th. Uh, and on the Hebrew calendar, it is the 10th of Shvat, Yud Shvat. So that's an important day uh, in the Chabad movement because uh, this day, Yud Shvat, uh, is both the yard site, the day that he passed away, uh, for the previous Rebbe, the Friedrich Rebbe, uh, who passed away, I believe, in 1950. And a year later, it was the day when the Lubavitcher Rebbe, the seventh Lubavitcher Rebbe, known as the Rebbe, uh, by people in the Chabad movement, when he assumed the mantle of leadership. Uh, so let's dedicate today's learning uh, to all the shluchim, all the emissaries, of the previous Rebbe and the current Rebbe, uh, Jews who really go above and beyond uh, out of love for their fellow Jews, right? When you see a Chabad house, you know, there, there, there's one in this neighborhood, in the next neighborhood. I mean, there's like many Chabad houses in LA. Okay, the Chabad rabbis who are in LA get the benefit of, you know, having each other in the same city. But there's also a Chabad rabbi you know, in a city in North Dakota and in a city in Russia and in a city, you know, in Argentina where they might be, you know, re really like the only Chabad Jew for, you know, a thousand miles, right? And it's a real sacrifice for him to take him and his, you know, they always do it together, right? The husband and wife, the rabbi and the rabbitson, and they take their children and they raise their children in these far flung places around the globe just so that they're going to be there available for any Jew in that community, in that place, any traveler coming through. I mean, the love of their fellow Jews that the Rebbe instilled into the entire Chabad movement is just extraordinary. Uh, and we honor his leadership and all of the emissaries around the world today on Yud Shvat. And we'll actually just start with a, a very quick little teaching of the Rebbe. Uh, which he taught on the day that he assumed the leadership, uh, almost 70, 70 years ago, right, 1951, uh, after his father-in-law, the previous Rebbe, passed away on the same day in the previous year, in 1950. When the Rebbe assumed the leadership, he taught that loving God, loving Torah, and loving one's fellow Jew are all one. Right? And you can't, you can't be a great Torah scholar who's not attached to God. You can't be a great Torah scholar who's not attached to the Jewish people. You can't you know, love Jews and love Torah, but not love God. Right? If you're deficient in any one of those three, so, so then you're ununified. Right? And that was a teaching that applies to Jews. Uh, but I think we can even extend it uh, more universally that one who, loves the one who loves God loves God's teaching and loves God's creatures. I think we can be inspired by that. Uh, and even for the non-Jews, who are so many in our community, uh, that that is a teaching they can take from the Rebbe, right? That if you love God, you should also love his creatures and love God's teaching, which is his Torah. Okay, so moving forward in our Talmudic journey, let's just check in here. Who's with us? Lynn says shalom from North Texas. Stefan from Vasa, Finland. That's so wonderful. I love when we have far from places. Uh, Lynn says, with a long O, like the book of Job, Lynn Job. Welcome, Lynn Job. And Marianne is in from Shropshire in the UK. Christo in the house from Texas. James from Indianapolis. It's so great to have you all with us. And Deborah from Florida. All right, in our Talmudic journey, we are now in chapter five of the first uh, tractate of the Talmud, Brachas. We are studying the Amidah, the prayer, the main prayer uh, that Jewish men are obligated to say three times a day, morning, afternoon, and evening. Some disagreement on what is the obligation for a woman. 
Uh, but if possible, she should try to say morning and afternoon, the Amida. And now we're looking a little bit of how the Amida is formulated. What is the, uh, the sort of philosophy behind which prayers are included in it, which blessings are included in it, and how do we approach saying it? That is what we've been studying. Uh, and I mentioned yesterday, at the end of yesterday, that today we begin with a little bit of a parallel discussion to the way we discussed when we were talking about the Shema. The Shema is <clears throat> taking on the yoke of heaven, right? Declaring God's unity. We're commanded to do that biblically, uh, morning and evening. Uh, but we were told that if while we're reciting the Shema, we're interrupted by a friend who greets us or by our teacher or a prominent person, so there under certain conditions, you can interrupt your prayer. Uh, you can interrupt your recital of the Shema. So the requirements for the Amidah, little different, a little different, because when we accept the yoke of heaven, when we declare God's unity and say that God you know, is, is the master of all, he's, he is one, and we're commanded to love him, we're, not actually, we're talking about God, not to God, right? Not with God. When we are reciting the Amidah, when we're praying, giving prayers of thanksgiving, pray, so it's praise, thanks, and supplication. So now we're directly engaging with God, we're talking with God, sort of face-to-face -face, as it were, uh, and we don't interrupt that unless it's, it's a much higher threshold to an interruption, right? So we don't stop our prayer because our friend or even our teacher or even a Jewish king, even if the king of Israel walked by, we don't interrupt our prayer to God in order to greet the king of Israel. Interestingly, if a non-Jewish king walks by, we do interrupt the prayer and greet him. Why? Because, you know, if a non-Jewish king walks by, it's presumably these, um, these teachings are given by our sages at the time that already the temple is down. We don't have our own land or our own sovereignty. So if, if a non-Jewish king is walking by, it's because we're probably in his power. He has authority over us. And to be rude you know, to a king uh, who is not subject to this, a Jewish king is subject to the same rules as we are. He'll understand why we don't interrupt the prayer to greet him. But a non-Jewish king who's accustomed to everybody, you know, treats him with absolute deference. If now a Jew is praying and doesn't give that non-Jewish king the respect that he thinks he's entitled to, so then the Jew is putting himself in danger. And therefore, we do interrupt the prayer to greet the non-Jewish king and also a violent person, right? So if someone's coming by that we think, you know, could cause us harm, there's real danger, so we would interrupt our, our prayer, our Amidah, to deal with the violent person. Uh, and we, so how do we interrupt? If possible, we kind of get to the end of the prayer quickly, we abridge the prayer, but if that's not possible, the danger is coming right up, so then you just interrupt the prayer. And then our sages recount an incident uh, where a pious Jew, a religious Jew, was traveling. He was on the road. It was the time to do one of the prayers, let's say the morning prayer. Uh, or maybe it was the afternoon prayer. I'm not sure. I don't think it specifies. Um, but he is on the road. He sort of steps to the side of the road. He's standing there. He's doing his prayer. And while he's immersed in his prayer, uh, an official walks by. Right, and let, and I, I'm not, it doesn't say which country he's in, but let's imagine it's he's in the Rome somewhere in the Roman Empire, and a Roman officer, right, or a go Roman government official walks by, and this government official, you know, representing the state of Rome, is accustomed to get a lot of deference, right, a lot of respect from the people, and as he walks by the Jew, he notices the Jew does not, you know, come out of his prayer. The Jew sees him but remains focused on what he's doing. And the guy can't believe that he's not being greeted. So he actually waits. <laughs> he stands there waiting. And then when the Jew finishes his prayer, the Roman official says, or the official, it's not specified that it's Roman, but let's say Roman, uh, says, you know, you did not greet me. I could kill you. Right? Just like that. I could kill you, you know, and, and no one would... Uh, no one in my uh, government, you know, none of the policemen who work for our government would say anything to me 
if I killed you for disrespecting a government official? And the Jew answered by saying, let me ask you a question. If you were summoned uh, to have a meeting with the emperor, or in this case, he says the king. So with your king, with a flesh and blood king, and then your friend walked by while you were speaking with the king, would you interrupt your conversation with the king to greet your friend? And the officer says, no. And the Jew says, and if you did interrupt your meeting with the king in order to greet your friend, what would happen to you? And the officer says, oh, they cut off my head. So the Jew says, okay. So if for a flesh and blood king who is here today and gone tomorrow, he's immortal, uh, you would not interrupt your interaction with him in order to greet another human, then how much more I, who've been summoned by the king of kings, the eternal, uh, to have this interaction with him, how could I interrupt my meeting with the king of kings in order to greet a human who's walking by? And the official said, okay, I get it, <laughs> and let him go. Now, someone asks, but didn't the Jew endanger himself? I mean, this is not actually the way you're supposed to conduct yourself because, you know, if that official really could have killed him and got away with it for not being respected, so then the Jew was being a little negligent with his own safety. And the sages answer, for whatever reason, he knew how this conversation was gonna go. Like he could tell that the official you know, might have a conversation about killing someone for being disrespected, but he wasn't going to do it. And maybe he could tell that from the fact that the official stopped and waited. <laughs> you know, and if he had actually spoken, uh, and, you know, or, or another, any kind of other manifestation of his potential violence, then this Jew certainly would have interrupted his prayer and protected himself, which is what you're supposed to do. Uh, right. So continuing on this subject of how to handle danger uh, as an interruption for the prayer. So the sages ask, what happens if a snake slithers up while you're praying and wraps itself around your leg? This is not so unlikely, right? Because snakes are cold blooded creatures and they might, you know, go up to a person if they, because he's so still and they might feel that, the snake might feel that it's safe to sort of wrap around the leg in order to get the warmth of the person. That's my interpretation. They don't say that, but you know, that they could happen. And, uh, and interestingly, the sages say, for a snake that comes up, uh, unless you have a reason to think that the snake is agitated and will endanger you, so you don't interrupt. But for a scorpion, you do interrupt. And for an ox, you do interrupt because those are a greater danger. I guess they were more accustomed that in that part of the world, snakes would occasionally like, you know, slither up to people without really being menacing. They were just looking for warmth, I think. Uh, but when a scorpion approaches or when an, when an ox approaches and you're not sure if it's a violent ox or not, so then you interrupt to, you know, move or do what you need to do to protect yourself. And an objection was raised uh, from, an, from another teaching in the Talmud that says, if you saw a person fall into a pit, if there was a lion in the pit, you cannot assume that, you, and, then, and then you had to go away, right? You didn't see what happened after the person fell into the pit with the lion in it. So you can't assume that the person died because he might've fallen in the pit with a lion in it and survived. Maybe the lion already ate, he's not hungry, uh, and the person can survive that ordeal. But if a person fell into a pit that contained snakes and scorpions, we're thinking of Indiana Jones, people who remember that movie, uh, then you can assume, even though you didn't see what happened, that the person was killed. So if we're saying that snakes aren't so dangerous, then how about this uh, pit with snakes and scorpions? Now here, I think it should have said snakes or scorpions, right? Because since we've already established that scorpions are dangerous, then it's a pit with snakes and scorpions. So, so what's the objection? We know that scorpions are dangerous, but what the sages mean to teach here is that even if it's only snakes in the pit, if you fall into a pit on top of those snakes, they will bite you because you know you scared them by falling on them. Uh, but a snake that just approaches a person who's standing there stock still and praying, so then there's no need to assume that that snake is gonna kill him. 
However, I would say strongly that if you're not sure what kind of snake is approaching you and you are, you know, immersed in your prayer and then, you know, you see a snake down around your foot, I think you should, I think it's a good teaching to not jump in fright. Uh, but, you know, if you need to get that snake away from you in the easiest way possible, maybe we need a, some input here from any snake experts. Because maybe, maybe it's a good idea. Maybe you should just stay prayer and stay stock still if the snake came and wrapped itself around you rather than jumping and swatting it away, which might be the thing that scares it and leads it to bite you. Hard to tell here. Uh, we move on. Now we're in a new Mishnah, uh, a new teaching from the earlier period, right? The Mishnah was uh, compiled around the year 200. The Gemara is the, the first commentary on the Mishnah compiled around the, the 6th or 7th century of the Common Era. So in the Mishnah, we're discussing special additions to the Amidah. Uh, we've already discussed a little bit about this uh, before. We add uh, two verses corresponding to rain, our prayer for rain in the rainy season. Uh, and we add a special edition for the Havdalah, meaning the separation between Shabbat and the rest of the week. On Saturday night, when Shabbat ends, we add a special blessing uh, for making the distinction between the holy and the mundane, between the, the holy day and the, rest, and the work week, right? And so we reflect that in the 18 blessings of the Amidah. The 18 blessings, which are 19, because as we discussed a few days ago, there was added in this, in this late Second Temple period, or actually in Yavna, it was added. It was introduced earlier, but it was officially added after, right after the Second Temple fell, which was the 19th blessing was the one against heretics, right? That God should get rid of the heretics from our midst. Okay, but we're adding, now we're told, uh, a blessing for rain, uh, actually two blessings for rain in the rainy season and one for Havdalah. So the question is, where do we add them within the Amidah, within the standing prayer? So rain gets added in two places. In the second blessing, uh, which is when we bless God for bringing the dead back to life, for revivifying the dead. And literally what we're talking about is in the Messianic age, God will bring the dead back to life. But spiritually, we're saying that having a relationship with God, you know, revivifies a person who is as if he is dead, right? And it's in that section, the second blessing, that we also add, uh, you know, who makes, the, who makes the rain, who makes the wind blow and the rain fall uh, in the winter season. And then in the ninth blessing, uh, the one who blesses, you know, blessed is the Lord, the one who blesses the years, uh, we will also add and who brings uh, the dew and the rain during the, the rainy season. Uh, and why there? Because that is the blessing for sustenance, right? We bless God who blesses the years, meaning in past years, we've been alive, right? We've been given the sustenance so that we would be alive until today. And may we continue to receive the sustenance that we need and especially in an agricultural society, for us to receive the sustenance that we need is to you know, have the land revivified by the water coming in the winter. For the Havdalah, the blessing uh, that separates Shabbat from the rest of the week, where do we insert that in the standing prayer? There's some dispute between uh, three sages. Um, I think it might be the sages, kind of an anonymous sage who says we do it in the fourth blessing, which is we bless God for graciously giving us knowledge, right? That we are, right, we are a species of animal that has knowledge, right? We, we, we talk and have knowledge of ourselves and of God, and we thank God for that. And that's the first of the middle blessings. It's the fourth blessing. And so the, for the distinction between Shabbat and the rest of the week, we insert it there, uh, on, on Saturday night, right? The one who gives us knowledge enables us to know also that, to distinguish between Shabbat and the week. Rabbi Akiva said, instead of inserting it in the fourth blessing, we create its own independent fourth blessing. And Rabbi Eliezer said, we add the, the blessing for distinguishing between the holy day and the rest of the week into the 
17th blessing, the second to last blessing, uh, which is the blessing of thanksgiving. Uh, but the, the law, the halakha, follows the anonymous Mishnah, which is that we, in, we insert the Havdalah blessing in the fourth blessing. Right? When, we, when we thank God, essentially we bless God for giving us knowledge, so we also add, and for, and for distinguishing and giving us knowledge of the distinction between the holy and the profane. And a message that's being communicated to us here is that for the sages, what is wisdom? What is wisdom? Wisdom is the ability to make distinctions, right? That's what wisdom really comes down to, uh, is the, the ability to see differences between one thing and another and to understand what are the traits of one thing and what are the traits of another. How are they similar? How are they dissimilar? And that's what so much of the Talmud is about sharpening and refining our understanding of distinctions. This is not uh, some kind of a social lesson about you know, promoting or, or, or uh, preventing divisiveness among people. This is the, uh, simply understanding what are the differences between people, between objects, between actions, between feelings, between words, just getting very careful and understanding what distinctions are. And that's why we'll put this blessing of Havdalah, distinguishing between holy and, and, and mundane, uh, in the blessing of knowledge, thanking God for giving us knowledge. Uh, the question is raised, if we bless God for making Havdalah, for separating between holy and mundane in the Amidah Saturday night, so do we do it later again over wine? Right? If you've ever been to a Havdalah ceremony, you know, you light the special Havdalah candle and you hold a cup of wine and we have some spice uh, and that's the Havdalah ceremony by itself. But if we've already said Havdalah in our evening Amidah, so you know, very typical way to end Shabbat is at the, at the, toward the end of Shabbat, late Saturday afternoon, we'll go back to synagogue, we'll do the, this, the Shabbat afternoon prayer, uh, and then maybe have a meal, hear a little Torah teaching, and then by then darkness has come, and we do the, the Saturday night, you know, evening Amidah, evening service, which is the regular week. We're out of Shabbat and now we're in the week. And then after that, we do Havdalah in synagogue or some people leave the synagogue so they can make Havdalah with their family at home. So if we've already said the Havdalah blessing for separating between holy and mundane in synagogue, do we do it over the wine as well in synagogue or at home? Uh, and what's interesting is the answer changed over time. Now, yes, the, the, the requirement is you make Havdalah in the Saturday night prayer and over the wine later, whether in synagogue or at home. But that didn't used to be that way. So in the second temple period, when they instituted the Havdalah prayer, they were already saying the Amidah in the early second temple period, right? So after we rebuilt the second temple, after the Babylonian exile, and the people were poor, right? When the Jews returned from Babylonia to Israel, they were like, it was sort of like, you know, the, the, the Jews of Europe went to Israel in the 1930s and 40s and 50s. They were, they were like refugees, you know, they, they didn't bring much. They didn't have much and they just got back and were working the land and doing the best they can, sort of like pioneers and settlers. And so there wasn't a lot of wine to go around. And so they just made their Havdalah in the Amidah Saturday night. But after the people had been there for a while, they became wealthy and they could afford the wine. So then they would say the blessing for Havdalah over the wine afterwards and not in the Amidah. Later, when they became poor again, they inserted it back into the Amidah and didn't require it over wine. So at, by the end of this period, when the second temple falls and our sages are figuring out, okay, what is going to be, you know, the, the law sort of going into the future, and which has stood for 2,000 years, is that you need to do both. You insert that blessing into the Amidah and say it over wine afterward. If you forgot to insert the Havdalah blessing in the Amidah on Saturday night, uh, but you did it later over the wine, you have fulfilled your obligation. This wasn't the right way to do it, the ideal way to do it, but you fulfilled your obligation. If you forgot to say Havdalah in the Amidah, in the service Saturday night, 
and then you forgot to make the Havdalah ceremony over the wine. So now you have to actually go back and do the Amidah again because you haven't fulfilled your obligation of saying Havdalah properly. What happens uh, when we have a festival immediately after Shabbat? So Shabbat was holy time, and then Saturday night we normally go back into the week. But let's say a festival begins Saturday night. Maybe it's Passover, maybe it's Shavuot, maybe it's Sukkot. This happens all the time. Uh, so now, all the time, but you know, regularly enough that we need to know how to handle it. Because now we're not separating between holy and mundane. We're separating between holy and holy. It's the holiness of Shabbat, and now we're going into the holiness of a festival. So how do we handle that? There was some dispute. You know, do we make that special blessing for that separation? Now there's no fourth blessing uh, of, the workday, um, of, the, of the weekday Amidah, in which we thank God for giving us knowledge and the ability to distinguish. That blessing's not there because we're going from the Shabbat Amidah to the festival Amidah, and neither one includes those, those 13 middle blessings, uh, which are the weekday blessings. So what do we do instead? Uh, what we do instead is we say a special formula, which was instituted in Babylonia, right? Rav Yosef said, uh, he, you know, because he heard that there were different practices about where to insert the Havdalah when Shabbat goes into, into a festival directly. And he says, well, I don't know this and I don't know that, meaning I don't know how they do it here and I don't know how they do it there. But I do know from the statements of Rav and Shmuel that they have instituted a pearl for us here in Babylonia because they established this version of the Havdalah for that situation where we go from Shabbat to a festival. And we say, you have made known to us, Lord our God, this is after the, th and, and just to, to clarify, for the Shabbat and festival and weekday Amidah, the first three blessings are always the same and the last three blessings are always the same. But then on Shabbat, there's only one blessing in between. And in the weekday, there's 13 blessings in between. Right? So these 13 blessings are missing from the Shabbat and festival Amidah. Why? Because we're not asking for a bunch of stuff. We're just thanking and praising God. Um, so when it's going into festival Amidah, we say, You have made known to us, Lord our God, your righteous laws, and taught us to perform your will's decrees, you have given us heritage seasons of joy and festivals of voluntary offerings. You have given us our heritage, you have given us as our heritage the holiness of Shabbat, the glory of the festival, and the festive offerings of the fe of pilgrim fe pilgrimage festivals. You have distinguished between the holiness of Shabbat and the holiness of the festival, and have made the seventh day holy over the six days of work. You have distinguished and sanctified your people, Israel, with your holiness, and you have given us, etc. And then you continue naming the festival for which you're thanking God for making that distinction between Shabbat and this new festival. So that's how we handle that situation. Uh, and what I skipped earlier is, you know, why do we put uh, Havdalah in that fourth blessing? Why did the law end up being there? One reason was because he gives us the knowledge to make distinctions. And the other reason was because the fourth blessing is the first of those weekday blessings. So that's the first opportunity to insert the Havdalah blessing. Uh, I don't think they were, they, they were not, there's not a definitive answer of what is the reasoning for putting it there. I like the idea that it's because wisdom equals making distinctions. Uh, but the fact is that is the law. Right, so when we say Havdalah Saturday night, we insert in the fourth blessing, unless it's into a festival, and then we say that special uh, blessing. And all of this is in any Jewish prayer book. It's just there for you to understand. Okay. Uh, right, so if, we mentioned that if you forgot the rain, if you forgot to say the, if you, made, if you forgot to make the Havdalah addition uh, into your Amidah, you fulfilled your obligation as long as you set it over wine, but if you forgot both in the Amidah and the wine, you have to go back and do the Amidah. If you forgot the rain blessing, you can go back, if you're still saying the Amidah, you can go back to the blessing where you omitted it, uh, if possible, and begin again from there. But if you finish the whole Amidah and you forgot to add the rain blessings, 
uh, which sometimes happens at the beginning of the season, right? Before we're accustomed to this addition that we say all through the winter. So then you have to go back and say the whole thing over again. Okay, then we go into a new Mishnah. It's pretty interesting, I'm adding a lot today because you know, in Brachas, there's so much richness in each of these pages. Uh, forgive me if, if I'm, you know, pointing out too many highlights to you, but I just think that, you know, we're not, I'm not doing everything on the DAF, but these are the things that really sort of, you know, scream out to me as important and worth covering. Uh, so we'll continue. And on this same DAF, on Brachas 33, we have a Mishnah that says, if a prayer leader starts to add certain things which are outside the formula uh, of what the prayer should be, we listen very closely. And if he says three types of things, then we stop him because we suspect that he's a heretic trying to introduce heresy into our prayer. This is a serious matter, right? So one thing is if he says, I give thanks, I give thanks, or we give thanks, we give thanks. He repeats giving thanks. Why is that a problem? It's because he might be saying that there are two deities, right? And he's thanking Hashem and he's thanking, you know, God forbid, some other deity, which is a, a total um, avodazara. That's idolatry, right? There's only, God is one. There's only one. So if he thinks he needs to thank two deities, then this person should not be leading us in prayer. If he says, we bless, we bless you, God, for the good, and then continues... So that's a problem, right? We do want to thank God for all the good in our lives, but we don't lead a prayer that way because really what we have to thank God for is everything in our lives, right? And it is a commandment to bless God for both the good and the bad, right? Things that seem bad and painful to us, there's a reason for them. This is, this is a basic tenet of our faith, that things, terrible things may happen to us, uh, but we don't say, well, God, I'm thank you for the good stuff in my life, but, you know, the bad I could do without. Because that's saying, you know, we know better than God what, what we need, right? The bad that comes our way, there's a reason for it. And we may not understand it in this lifetime, right? This is not a way to console people who are having a terrible time. They were just there for them and comfort them. Uh, but for ourselves, we need to know that both the good and the bad are given to us for a reason, and we bless God for both the good and the bad. And then this sort of odd little formulation, if the prayer leader says something like, just as you extend your mercy even to a bird's nest, so you should extend your mercy to us, you know, your people. And we actually silence him for that. So the bird's nest is this idea, there's a, there's a commandment in the Torah uh, that we don't take uh, the chicks and the mother on the same day. Or if we're going to take eggs from a nest, we shoo the mother bird away. That's what it is. If we're going to take eggs from a nest, you know, because we're going to eat them, we can do that. But if the mother is there, we shoo her away first so that she doesn't see us taking away the eggs. It's such a it's such a gentle little commandment to perform. It's actually one that's not easy to perform. We rarely get the opportunity to take eggs from a nest and shoo the mother away. If you ever get that opportunity, it's special. Um, but, but the idea that we're saying to God that, well, look, I mean, your commandments, you show you have so much mercy, even for this little mother bird and her eggs, how much more should you have mercy on us? We're having a tough time here. We don't like that from a prayer leader because it says that, you know, God is behaving wrongly if he doesn't send us that mercy. Like, we know better. God should conform God's self to our logic. And that's something that we reject. We understand that people really suffer in this world and that we don't understand the reasons for it. But our faith is that there is a reason for it. And for myself personally, Whenever I'm confronted with really terrible suffering, what makes it tolerable for me is the idea, well, we have eternal souls. You know, we 100%, each of us is a soul. We're riding around in a body for the amount of time that we're alive as a human being. And then we'll return to the world of souls. So if indeed we are an eternal soul, okay, alongside infinity, no matter 
you know, how terrible a human lifetime can be, uh, you know, there's going to be time <laughs> later to make up for that. And who knows, maybe the more we suffer in this world, the more we'll learn from our time here. You know, I would think it's certainly true that when we think about the experiences in our lives that molded us, that we appreciate, that we really learned from, that made us better human beings, it's rarely sitting on a beach and sipping a drink. Right? The things that, you know, make us grow and become better people were the tough times. And so perhaps having real, you know, real huge challenges in life has to do with what our soul needed in this journey. Again, this is not an idea we throw at somebody when they're suffering. Then we just comfort them. But for me, and perhaps for you, when you think to yourself about the tough times in your life, maybe that will be helpful. Uh, and then finally, um, we have a teaching here that is just so beautiful. Uh, and it's a very famous teaching from the Talmud. And I didn't write down who said it, so let me make sure I teach it in the right person's name. Yes, it's Rabbi Hanina. Okay, so Rabbi Hanina said, everything is in the hands of heaven except fear of heaven. Everything is in the hands of heaven except fear of heaven. Right? So this is where free will is being addressed, right? God is running the world. God is making sure that everything happens the way God wants. And yet, paradox, uh, fear of heaven is left to us, right? God will not command us to worship him. God actually commands us to love him, but doesn't enforce that commandment, right? It's up to us whether we're going to follow that commandment or not. It's up to us whether we will love God or not. And love is commanded, fear is not, right? God does not command, well, I guess at some point it says you shall, because Moses says right then, uh, as it is stated, and now Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you other than to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all of his ways, to love him and to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And then the sages ask, is fear of heaven a minor matter that it can be presented as if God is not asking anything significant? Like all God asks of you is that you should have fear of heaven, right? The fact is it's left to us, right? He doesn't make it happen. He may tell us that we should fear heaven. He may tell us that we should love him, uh, but he leaves it up to us whether to do that or not, right? That is the essence of free will. Everything is in the hands of heaven except fear of heaven. If we do develop fear of heaven, there's great reward, there's relationship, there's humility, there's growth. It's incredibly good for a person to have fear of heaven, but it is up to the person whether they're going to do it or not. This idea that it was a minor matter uh, is me, they explain that, you know, all God asks of you <laughs> is that you fear him uh, it, it, because those are the words of Moses. Right. For Moses, fear of heaven was not that challenging. You know, he naturally had fear of heaven. And we might say, well, yeah, Moses knew God. <laughs> Moses spent 40 days and nights on the mountain with God. And then he did it again. <laughs> and, you know, and said no one has ever known God as closely as Moses did, who spoke with God face to face. Uh, and God showed Moses his glory, etc. No one knew as much of God while still a living human being as Moses. So yeah, fear of heaven came naturally to him. But you and I are not prophets and we don't have that experience. And we don't see God's, God's glory manifest, obviously. And, you know, God, I don't know about you, but God doesn't speak to me, uh, you know, in, in, in the language of men and say, hey, Sal, do this and hey, Sal, do that. Right. So to develop fear of heaven is not a small matter. It's something that actually takes work to submit to be in awe of heaven, to develop that awe, it's actually something you got to work on every day. And I must say that since I've been teaching this class and so I'm you know, reading the DAF every day, not just reading it, but taking notes on it and getting ready so that I can share it with you, I've learned it at a whole other level. And especially because we've been talking about prayer every day, uh, so now, lately, <laughs> my prayer has been totally transformed. Uh, I'd like to hear from people if, you know, maybe for some of you, 
you know, talking about this each day, doing this study or listening to me teach you about it, is it affecting your prayer? Because it is definitely affecting mine. And particularly this idea that we need a moment of transition before we start prayer. And so, you know, now every time, three times a day, like before I go into that Amidah, we have the practice of taking three steps back and then three steps forward. And that can just be very routine. Just, okay, three steps back, three steps forward and start reciting it. But I've really thought about, okay, I take those three steps back and now know before whom you stand, I'm gonna be approaching God. I wanna do that in reverence and joy as we've been learning. So reverence is awe, fear, right? That's the fear of heaven. So I'm like, okay, I'm coming before my maker and keenly aware that I've let him down in many ways. I've not lived up to my potential, you know, not today, not yesterday, not, not every day. I could have done more. I could always do better. For, I know how I could do better and I'm trying, but I could do better. And then at the same time, joy, because I'm being summoned be, before a God who loves me. So it's like, I, I, you know, he can judge me. I, I've let him down, but yet, I'm coming before someone who loves me so that fear and joy go together. And as I take those three steps forward, that's what I'm thinking about. And man, it changes what comes after. Now I'm in the right frame of mind, that right mindset for prayer. Uh, And likewise, when I say Shema, right, now I'll teach it so I can say, you know, God's name for that purpose. When I say, with my eyes closed, Shema Yisroel Adonai Eloheinu. Adonai Echad. That Echad, one. Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And we can prolong that one, as we learned uh, some pages ago here in Brachus, we prolong that one at the end long enough to consider you know, that God's dominion is over everything. That's accepting the yoke of heaven, like actually imagining it. God made the world, God runs the world, and I want to like feel that as I'm saying the one. Again, transforms my prayer. What comes after that is at a much deeper level than if I just ran through it. So these teachings, they're not just intellectual. These are practical teachings that can affect the way we approach our day and can approach our relationship with God. Uh, I think that's all that I had to say. Um, I'm going to look at questions in a moment, but again, just in case you joined this late, today is Yud Shvat, the 10th of Shvat, uh, in the Chabad movement. We're, we're not Chabadniks, uh, but we really love Chabad. We have so many friends uh, who are Chabad rabbis and part of the Chabad movement, and, uh, and we really honor you know, the teachings of Chabad and the work that they do bringing love to the world in a very, I mean, it's an army of people dedicating their lives to love of their fellow Jews. And so uh, on this day on which the previous Rebbe was Nifter, the previous Rebbe died, and this is his yard site, and the last Lubavitcher Rebbe, the seventh Rebbe, assumed the leadership both on this day, the 10th of the Hebrew month of Shvat, we share a teaching of the Rebbe's that he gave on the day he assumed the leadership 69 years ago uh, in 1951. And he said that loving God, loving Torah, and loving one's fellow Jew are all one. And if you're deficient in either of those three, any of those three, then there's something missing from yourself and from your unity. You have to love them the same. And we think, and I believe that that teaching extends to all people, that loving God means you want to love his Torah, love God's teaching, and love God's creatures, right? That's something you need to do, is have a love for God's creatures, you know, people especially. And we make that distinction, by the way. Animals and people are not the same, right? If you you have to choose between saving an animal and saving a human, you save the human, and you save the human for a reason. That is an important distinction. Okay, let me just see. Joe Branson says, when you study to teach, you truly study at a higher level, 100%, whether it's the Talmud or any other content area. I appreciate the way you present information that you give the gift of your time. Thank you, Joe. Thank you very much. Uh, It has really been a commitment 
um, you know, to not just do the page, but to learn it, take notes and get ready and then share it with you guys. It's a big time commitment, but I feel like it's a gift to me and my family. I'm, I'm getting so much out of it. It's not going to be always easy to find the time. It hasn't been easy. There have been sacrifices, but it's so worth it. And God, please strengthen me that I can keep that I and we, you and me, can keep this going for the whole seven and a half year cycle. What's today's class is uh, like 30, I'm, te- I'm doing DAF 33, right? So we're, it's the 32nd class, so 32 down and 2,688 uh, to go. <laughs> 2711 minus 33, my math wasn't so good. Uh huh. Dominic, any chance of obtaining what is written in the 19th blessing or where it can be found in writing? Yeah, sure. So that's the blessing against heretics. Uh, so here's a, a regular prayer book. Let's just open to Shakrit, the service for the weekdays. And okay, so so here's an, a translation. This is from the prayer book to Hillas Hashem. Uh, this is actually the Chabad prayer book, but I, I have lots of different sidurim that I use. But here, this is a good English translation. Let there be no hope for informers. And may all the heretics and all the wicked instantly perish. May all the enemies of your people be speedily extirpated. That's a good word, extirpated. And may you swiftly uproot, break, crush, and subdue the reign of wickedness speedily in our days. Blessed are you, Lord, who crushes enemies and subdues the wicked. And please understand that that prayer is not saying you know, God, please destroy people who have a different religion than us. That is not what it's saying at all. This is a very sp- particular thing. It's a prayer against the heretics who are coming into and among the Jewish people and trying to steer them in a different way, particularly the Sadducees in the Second Temple period. That's why heretics is the key word there. Okay. Uh huh. All right, my friends, thank you for joining me. This was uh, Brachus 33 on AT Daily. Uh, I think our takeaway from today is, uh, you know, we, we, the main little one, right, is, is that we don't interrupt our prayer, uh, our time with God, even for a king, as long as it's a Jewish king, right? But with a non-Jewish king or just a violent person, who presents a danger to us, of course we interrupt because life above all things. But if you can imagine, right, like King David would come walking by, <laughs> right, King David, or the Messiah, by the way, the Messiah could come walking by, but if you're in your prayer, you don't interrupt your FaceTime with God uh, until you've finished and then you greet the Messiah. All right, my friends, And I'm pretty sure that's true about the Messiah. It's definitely true about a human king. And a Messiah is a human. So I'm assuming that that's going to be true as well. My friend sending you big love from L.A.